morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to day one of the Education Summit. We're really excited and happy to have you all here. My name is Deeksha. Um, I am joined by a few uh, additional people from the course here side. Our role today is just to help support the session in whatever way is required, whether you're having any Zoom issues or um, when we can go into the question and answer portion of it, then to support our speakers. Um, without taking up any more of your time, I want to pass it off to Ingrid. Uh, this is an exceptionally special group of people and we are so happy to have them here today. Um, Ingrid, I'm going to ask you to take it forward from here. Diksha, thank you so much. And thanks for all of the great work you and Angie are doing in the background. You know, as Terrence Wooten always says, teamwork makes the dream work. So we're all part of a team and we're very happy uh, to be working with you all today. And I want to welcome everyone. So great to see you all, even in this Zoom platform. And I want, I want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon. And certainly thanks to, to our Course Hero colleagues for extending this, um, this amazing invite to participate in this year's virtual uh, academic summit, education summit, sorry. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it's an honor to always roll with my co-panelists, Terrence Wooten and Gay Johnson. Thank you, Gay, Terrence, for taking the time out of your hectic schedules as we think about why and how a black presence matters within online education especially at this particular historical moment. So to that end, I'm going to take us back to 1998. At that time, I was an assistant professor of Black Studies at Virginia Tech. And on one occasion, I was asked by a colleague if I was interested in teaching my Introduction to African American Studies course online. I began to think about what it would mean for me as a Black female professor to leave the classroom for the virtual realm as well as what it would mean for Black studies to leave the space of the university, given the his history of protests that ushered in the institutionalization of the discipline on, college, on U.S. college campuses in 1968 and starting with San Francisco State. I did what we all do as academics, right? I started writing, and in October 1998, I published an op-ed article in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Reliance on technology threatens the essence of teaching. I discussed my concerns about being a Black female professor, teaching Black studies, and specifically teaching about urgent social problems such as racism, sexism, patriarchy, heterosexism, homophobia, the racial wealth gap, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> Excuse me. And being asked to do so within an online con context where students could ostensibly tune me out. In addition, given, given that the number of Black professors is so low in our profession, and also being cognizant of the history of Black studies and how it has been marginalized in comparison to traditional disciplines, I grappled with a very troubling idea about my presence being erased within the context of online education. I ended the piece by urging universities to think critically about employing a liberal application to online education. The one size fits all model could actually pose harm to the presence of black bodies as well as black studies. A lot has changed since 1998, we know this. We know that online teaching and learning have been useful in democratizing education. Though access to technology remains an issue, and we saw this with public schools this past spring. But still, democratizing education is a good thing. In 2018, I decided to revisit my thoughts from 20 years prior. I wanted to think about the contours of Black presence in online education. I invited Terrence Wooten to join me, and then we invited, we invited our colleague and dear friend Tracy Johnson, professor of biology and the incoming dean of life sciences at UCLA, to join us in crafting the piece. We felt that as three Black educators across the humanities, social sciences, and STEM, 
We could provide a diverse and interesting commentary on what we term a Black pedagogy of presence in online education. We began working on the first, uh, I guess, yes, there's so many different drafts. <laughs> but we began working on the article in fall 2018 and finished the sixth draft in early uh, March of this year, actually. Now, at that moment, we were, we were not where we are now with the pandemic. But, but the coronavirus was certainly in our midst. What was interesting is that what we began writing in 2018 didn't drastically change in light of the pandemic and the subsequent protest in the spring. This week, we are putting the final touches, fingers crossed, on that piece to send out for review. So that is how we got to this panel today. In 1998, I, I, I had a choice to pass on teaching out online. I didn't have to do it. The pandemic took that choice away in spring 2020 for so many of us. Gay and I both taught online, online courses this past spring. Gay and Terrence taught courses in, in winter and got caught in, in literally the overnight reality of having to move from on-site to remote teaching during the last week of classes in mid-March. As many of you know who taught in the winter and, and spring of this year, moving to online remote teaching and learning was surreal in many ways. So the pandemic was real and, and it would end up shaping our pedagogy. Then the protests against centuries long anti-blackness erupted in 50 states across the country in the wake of a spate of killings of black people. Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, and George Floyd. In the spring quarter, the convergence of the pandemic and protests provided an opportunity to put into practice what we outlined. But we did so within the context of a pandemic that disproportionately affects Black people and protests that centered Black lives, making our presence as Black educators that much more urgent. Now, I did not have the privilege, nor did I want it, to zoom into my 19th century African-American history course and not discuss how COVID-19 is highlighting and exacerbating inequalities that can be traced back to the enslavement era. I could not zoom into that class two days after George Floyd was murdered and not discuss the relationship between what we were reading about that week. One, the long history of the discomfort far too many whites have when black people occupy public space. Hence, the move to legalize segregation in public transportation in the 19th century. And two, we also uh, were learning about and reading about Ida B. Wells' anti-lynching campaign. Now, despite my concerns 22 years ago about teaching online, I understood that, that as a black professor, I could still be present by making office hours mandatory. In fact, this is one of our best practices for a Black pedagogy of presence. I split students in, into eight groups, and I met with each over the course of two days for 30 minutes each week. Yes, it was a lot of work and way more time um, than I spent engaged with students um, than on site. And I spent a lot of time engaging with students even on site. Now, students did not sign up for online education at my university. So I was committed to ensuring that along with taking a rigorous course, they would get the same thing online as on site. The benefit of me, my presence, Ingrid Banks and all of my glory. And there are already lawsuits. We know this, lawsuits that, that students have brought against institutions because those students are making the argument that online instruction is inferior to what they receive on site. Perhaps some of that has to do with the fact that so many of us were pushed into teaching remotely without proper preparation. But some of it is also about being present and frankly, doing our job. This is what I know without a doubt. My students have the benefit of my presence, albeit remotely, as a black female professor, because my presence was central to my pedagogy. And that fact took me back to 1998 when I wrote the Chronicle op-ed 
and was on my mind as I worked with Terrence and Tracy on, on the current article and even talked to Gay over the course of the winter and spring about just the challenges of teaching online, but also the challenges of teaching online during a pandemic and a protest and uh, being professors of ethnic studies. So as black educators, we do not enjoy the privilege of not thinking about our presence. And not just because our presence is for good, but also because we are reminded of our presence, our blackness in ways that underpin tokenism, anti-blackness, and the system of white supremacy. I have an example for you. So in my 19th century African-American history course, a white female student challenged my authority, my expertise, by stating to me without any hesitation whatsoever, and I quote her, I asked other professors to read my paper and they did not believe it deserved a below average grade, end quote. Now I'm not naive to believe everything that students tell me, right? But it doesn't matter if the student was telling me the truth or not. The point is that she had no problem making the comment that called into question my authority as a professor. Now I didn't bite, but it was empowering for me in that she had to make the comment in my presence, even though we were on Zoom. She had to face me and face the fact that despite her uh, offensive statement, I was the only one with a PhD between the two of us and her grade would stand. <clears throat> now, what, what I have come to understand is that my presence matters rather on site or online. And the good fight that me, Terrence, and Gay wage is persistent, regardless of the spaces we teach in. We know this. We talk about this all the time. We understand that anti-Blackness survives natural disasters, pandemics, wars, austerity me measures, police brutality, all of it. But we're not so cynical and that we give in to anti-Blackness in our profession, whether it comes from our white students and colleagues or scholars of color who maintain that status quo. We know that our Black presence matters in ways that enrich the spaces we occupy. And those spaces and the people who occupy them are better for our presence, even when they call into question our right to be in those spaces as Black educators. And even when we call out our colleagues for participating in anti-Blackness. And on that note, I am honored to pass the mic to my esteemed colleague and dear friend, Terrence Wooten. Uh, thank you for the invitation to participate. I'm excited seeing the faces um, here, um, reminding us that, you know, creating spaces for us to work with collaboratively each other as educators is really important. And I, um, we have, some of that has been forgotten, I think, in certain ways. And so it's nice to be in a space to share and exchange ideas, also with two fabulous colleagues that I have admired. And now I get to call colleagues um, and friends. And so um, I want to start out by telling, well, no, I actually want to start out by making a few declarations. Um, one, Many, most of, if not all, Black faculty, staff, and students are struggling right now. Check on, in on them. For non-Black folks, this is an opportunity for you to not only check in on, but also be mindful of the fact that many of us are, are struggling. There has been a lot of conversations about the, issue, um, the struggles for students, and I think faculty and staff have fallen out of that conversation, except for to talk about our productivity and our labor. Um, so we emerge in these conversations simply as uh, commodities. And if we're gonna, in, in thinking about uh, the, the context of this, this panel um, and a concentration on anti-Blackness, we have to get outside of that model. And so how do we think about Black people as humans, which is also to say, um, don't call on us to do the work that you are capable of doing yourselves. 
Um, we are educators. We are, uh, many of us are PhD holders on this call. We are researchers. So we have the tools and access to actually do research. So many of you did not know what a cell was until you researched it and now you're a biologist. Um, there is plenty of literature on black life, on black history. A lot of universities have African American studies departments or programs or black studies departments or programs. Um, you have experts on campus who have published scholarship. Read it. Um, there is a certain kind of ch a drain that has been happening on black minds right now as people are turning to us to give solutions, um, which to me is like a student coming to your office hours who's never come to class. You would expect them to go back, do readings, educate themselves, bring questions. And I feel like we're at a moment where black faculty are being um, called upon without those same set of expectations that people do the work. Um, because that is draining and it's an additional kind of labor and service on us that doesn't allow us to the space and capacity to heal because black students are struggling. And one of the things that we definitely do know is that students who have faculty members who look like them in the classroom do better. They learn more, they absorb the information more, they feel seen, they feel validated, they feel like they belong. We have been doing that work and we have already, and now in the context of a global pandemic, we've been called upon to, to do that work even more because they are in the context of their struggles, they are turning to us as therapists, as uh, which we already kind of were functioning as, as, um, as mentors, as collaborators in the struggle. So we're doing a lot of that work. And so just to say, this is, a, this is a start, but don't let this conversation or this participation be the end. Um, there, you, you can do the work. Um, so now I wanna start with two, two stories. Um, I'm an assistant professor. I just finished my first year, which was a great year to start the tenure track clock. Um, good times. And so in, in my graduate education, I actually had the opportunity to teach online, which I too, like Dr. Banks, was very um, wary of going online or teaching a course online um, until I had a class uh, on popular culture and in the middle of me lecturing about hegemony and how hegemony works um, and Adorno and just fun stuff. A student, a white female student raised her hand and um, when I said, does anyone have any questions for clarification? She raised her hand, I called on her and she said, um, I just want to let you know that I think you're really sassy and I love it. Like I feel you're, you're my favorite professor because just, just at, like you're so young, it's mind boggling. And just the way you deliver information, it really like, I really feel like I understand it. I think it's because you're sassy and I'm sassy. And, and I was like, what is happening here? I'm, do, do I cuss her? Like, what do, how, what do I do? So in that moment, black, the two black students in the classroom were looking at each other and looking at me, and I was looking at them and look at, looking at them look at each other. And then I was trying to figure out what to do with this student. And ultimately, I feel like I failed. I kind of stumbled through a response. I shifted and, and you know, uh, got back to the question at hand because I was really cognizant of the fact that I was young and black and gay being called sassy by a white student as some kind of affirmation. And I felt like I was in a trap where if I corrected her on the sassiness, I'm, I would be a, sort of participating in a kind of phenphobic respectability politics. But on the other hand, if I was read as too aggressive, this would impact my teaching evaluations and ultimately how I was viewed in my department. So then the opportunity to teach online came up again. I was like, absolutely, I need to get out of the classroom because I can't be, I, nope, it's, I, gotta, I gotta escape to online. And in the moment, I was thinking of it as a disembodied experience, as if being Black online somehow mitigated the kind of hypervisibility that I was experiencing in the classroom. Um, until I got the uh, set of discussion posts where students, where two students had decided, um, one particularly um, passionate student, um, that he was going to write about how um, homophobia was, uh, uh, homosexuality was ruining um, the Black community. And I was like, well, this, this is really about me, come to find out. Come to find out I'm not not in the classroom. I hadn't been thinking about how to be in the classroom. I was thinking in, instead about how not to because the classroom was not a safe space for me. It was not a welcoming space for me. It was deeply violent, but yet somehow, my, somehow mine. Um, so fast forward now as an assistant professor who's going in to start teaching an online class um, in the summer, I have been, as a lot of black faculty have been, on a number of calls in the summer, Zooms, 
um, with students who are going through crises. And so I was with a collective of about 70 students who are first generation, um, largely black and brown students. And there has been, if you um, haven't seen the sort of resurgence of a question that many black faculty have asked themselves or as students have asked themselves, which is a question of when was the first time you ever had a black teacher? This has been circulating on Twitter and on Facebook. And so I decided to ask this collective of students, when's the first time you had a black faculty? Working at an institution where roughly two point, not roughly, specifically 2.7% of the faculty is black, I thought I was expecting a lot of them to have low numbers or no numbers at all. I was not, not surprised, I was not disappointed. That's largely their response that they hadn't had a black faculty, taken a class with a black faculty member yet, or only one and they were graduated, they were getting ready to graduate. One student sent me a private Zoom message though, and this stuck out to me. And she said, um, I haven't had a black faculty member before. In fact, I'm taking your summer class. I'm so excited to take a class with you. And this reminded me of the importance of being my being Hello. Me in the class. This isn't the main class. And mm. then and then uh, I when I was setting up the class, I noticed online actually that she had taken a class. In, the, um, in the, the spring online with a professor I knew to be black. So she had experience as if she hadn't had a class with the black professor before because the course was run asynchronously without a, a, a component, component of one-on-one of -on -one office hours or she did not attend those office hours or there was no um, lecture. And so she had a whole class with the black professor that she did not know was a black professor. This has really aligned now with this piece that we have been working on to think about how it is to be the, the importance of being black and the of uh, having a black body presence, more than just a body, but black presence, and now we're being Zoom bombed in the classroom, which is also a reminder of the, how these technologies uh, work and how these technologies are deeply disruptive. And the very thing that I was worried about happening in, in the brick and mortar classroom, come to find out happens in digital spaces too, because black bodies, black intel intelligence, and black spaces are often understood as spaces that white, white folks or non-black people can infiltrate and do harm and damage to walk away and then we get to heal collectively. And then other people get to ask us how to, to set up these spaces in more responsible ways. Nevertheless, um, sidebar just got, just, just, that was just a tangent of trigger. So um, there are two things that I want to say um, about how it is that I have been intentional and then in the last, the last week of winter quarter when we were thrust online, um, I have been intentional to make sure that as a gay black male professor, very small amount of us, um, that I insist that I take up space, claim space, create space for people to enter into my classroom. One of the very important things that I do, if you notice in the background, is I use virtual backgrounds as a way to articulate a number of things. One, it articulates um, a set of politics to my students. My students know when they come into my classroom already, vert already, off jump, they know where I stand. I, I um, switch these out. And in fact, I've started curating a set of Black Lives Matter backgrounds that I'm going to be using throughout. And I'm timing those with sequentially with the, the course content itself. So I already have in mind in construction of the space, the kind of backgrounds that I'm going to have with each weekly reading, week, weekly set of readings, because I want to not only optically reinforce, but I want the first thing that they see to be a, an affirmation of a set of politics that they can connect to. In the brick and mortar class, uh, in my brick and mortar office, a lot of us have signs. This is a safe space, or we might have uh, various different literatures of events that we want to um, on campus. And then our book titles articulate a thing. We don't have the, the convenience of a brick and mortar space anymore. So using this digital background helps do that work that my brick and mortar, the books on my shelves already do. The other thing, it's just a place of it's a piece of conversation. So I have a background that I sometimes use, which I'm going to try to talk and put it up at the same time. I'm not sometimes use. It's it's it, you know it's in my circulation, and so it's uh it's a, a background on this is about defunding the police, which of course now I can't find because I have fifty seven thousand backgrounds. Um, a student asked me, "What does defunding the police mean?" In chat. That wasn't the topic of conversation, but this was a moment for learning. And so we, I said, 
great. We can use these backgrounds to cre create space, but also that these backgrounds can be used as a, um, um, a modality for communication and an entry point for students for learning. I don't just put political quote unquote political statements, although I think most uh, uh, communication is political, I also put affirmations. So I find ways to also affirm that we know that they're in crisis and we're in crisis and we know the, the power of affirmation. So I put affirmations and validations is also in my background. The other thing to iterate um, Ingrid's point about office hours, I have now, I've constructed office hours in two ways. So I do this thing where I'm doing office hours, which is for students who want to have um, meetings one-on-one -on -one to talk about content, which is a space where folks can come together collectively. They can just drop in and if they want to talk about course content or they want to talk about something, it's largely related to the course. But this is, an, uh, students understand that this is a shared space. So if they have more one-on-one -on -one personal conversations that they want to be having, um, those are for office hours. And if they want to be part of a collective space to socialize with their colleagues around course content, which I'm there to facilitate. I call that social hours. I wasn't gonna call it happy hours because I like to do cute things, but then I thought, one, it's probably not gonna be that happy because I'm teaching a history on African American, like a black life in America, which is not the happiest of stories. And two, um, uh, and from, because I'm teaching it from the vantage point of white rage, which is definitely not a happy story. And then two, um, I don't need them to be happy. And also I just don't want them getting turned up in their homes. In, uh, for class. So it's our social hours. And so this has been an intentional uh, disaggregation so students can understand the kinds of um, uh, the kinds of each one is for and therefore the kinds of conversations that they can have. Um, I've also extended as has Ingrid the amount of office hours I'm having to compensate for the fact that um, of crisis. And the last thing that I would say is that we're in a moment, we've been in a moment for about the last decade where, where the uh, digital humanities, particularly African American digital humanities has been on the, rive, on the rise. And so there's a compendium of digital archives that we can be using. Instead of re trying to recreate or create the wheel, we have pre-existing sets of archives that Black archivists have already organized. If you go to blackpast.org, they have a beautiful list of various different teaching tools. Um, so one, it's an opportunity to, to connect, for students to connect um, to these digital archives. Two, it's taking advantage of the fact that we are digital. And so how do we tap into pre-existing digital interfaces um, that allow, that is super educative for students, it is part of research, and that you can fold into your class, which is on, in my last 11 seconds, I will say this. Have you thought about your learners, your black students as learners? You have not thought about how race structures and shapes your syllabus, structures and shapes your field, structures and shapes your teaching, you are doing a disservice not only to your Black students, but also to your non-Black students who are, have, get an opportunity to understand as someone learning to enter into the discipline, how it is that they can start to think about race and, and particularly Blackness and anti-Blackness in relationship to the course content. You have an opportunity to really rework and reframe and re reshape how it is that you teach in service to Black students as learners. And I I'm going to charge, not encourage, I'm going to charge every one of you all to do so. And with that, I will turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Gay Johnson. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Terrence and Ingrid, for your excellent, excellent comments. And I wanted to say that um, the Zoom bombing is actually analogous to our existence in the institution. I want to say that because in this moment, it is very difficult to teach about social justice. And so, several people were saying, oh, I'm so impressed that you all are continuing. I believe it's because we are so well trained in the distractions around white supremacy, the ways that the politics of the institution, can you hear me? Someone uh, well, muted me. Okay, great. Uh, the ways that the politics of the institution are constantly working to marginalize and we speak anyway. And so I, I really want to thank everybody for hanging in there because this is just what we do. So um, to the, I want to come back full circle to what Professor Banks was saying because um, this idea of the Black pedagogy of presence is so important right now. It's more, more than ever. And I'm so grateful that you wrote this piece, but that you are like kind of, re, you know, re, re, resuscitating and revitalizing it and renewing it as it were, because 
we, we, we need this more than ever. It is so important for Black people, and, and really for, for, for all of us, but especially for Black people, to be present in the academic space. Why? Especially because in, in popular culture, we are overrepresented in so many ways that do not serve us. But in places like this, we are so few. The number of uh, Black tenured professors is, is so few across the nation. The, the fact that you could be a Black associate professor, a Black full professor is less than 1%, that, that possibility of being a Black woman full professor is less than 1% across the nation. And so just the presence that we have is very important just to be seen. But then if we keep, if we kind of keep on this course here and we think about what it means to be present, it really came into sharp relief for me when the pandemic hit because of this quick switch. It was so difficult for so many of our students and especially our black students, our low income students, our, stu our, our first generation students, students who working in the cafeteria and sending their wages home on a regular basis to their parents. People who now had to move in with their parents or who were house insecure, um, who were moving in with siblings and their siblings' children, their backs against the fridge, they're trying to learn and zoom into a, a, a classroom. We realize across um, all of the, the noise that we often hear about equity, diversity, inclusion, that there, there really was no commitment in the way that we knew was needed for our students. We knew that while there's a lot of people who are doing really important work in these spaces, that it never, ever was meant to solve the problem. Because it, if it had been, we wouldn't have had the, the, the lack of access and the, the kind of disparities that we saw um, when the pandemic hit. So in some ways, it brings us all into, into sharp relief. And I wanted to, to, then, to, to then talk about why it's so important for us to then be present. I want to say that because with, with so much disparity um, around um, access, uh, poverty, what are the issues that people are facing as, they're, as, as they are engaging with us now? Online? And please remember, I mean, all of us have been trained. We're all educators. We're all here to do a, a particular job, as both of my co-speakers have, have said. And so what does it mean to do that job at this time? Also, what are the expectations of the students? For many of us, this, of our students, the, it, this time makes the institution seem even bigger. It, it gives it more authority because it, in the absence of any kind of federal integrity, any kind of national uh, integrity at the national level, at the leadership level, a lot of people were looking to institutions, um, their schools, to take some kind of leadership role about what, what was next. Um, and so it's a kind of a dangerous time because people are desperate and they need the institution to step up and be what it promises to be. But when you've seen how all of these inequities are, 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 are ingrained in, in the mission of the institution, while on the one hand it says, especially in the University of California, let there be light, like people come in, you know, we, we're here for you. But that, and, and all these years that we've been saying, SATs are biased, they don't, they don't work for people of color or people who are low income, especially folks who can't afford the SAT preps, who didn't go to the schools that were, um, that had the AP prep courses and AP courses, et cetera. They don't, they, they're not a measure of intelligence. We've been saying this forever. And we knew this as a community, there's studies done. And yet, and, and then what happens right after the pandemic hits and, and, and revenue is an issue, what happens? The University of California says, no more SATs. No more letter grade minimums, A through G requirements. The things we'd always been saying and fighting to say and met with, you know, scorn and kind of ridicule and kind of, oh, you know, these are the people who are always say this, trying to, try, trying to secure a, a, a foot in the institution. And yet it, that's all it took, right? Is, the, is all of a sudden the narrative changes. So the lesson for me, and I think for so many of us was that just our presence in the institution is was itself like not really meant to happen and secondly that when faced with a challenge that actually reveals that uh, the, the sort of corporate nature of educa that education has become 
then what we've been saying all along is and and what and, and the ways that we've been encouraged to doubt our intuition around what was the right thing for our communities and our classrooms is actually true it, i mean and, and the institution now has to make big i mean good on that so 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 when so coming back to this question around around the perception of the institution becoming bigger it puts students but also professors of color into a, a very tricky situation because then in the absence sometimes of many institutions that let a lot of students down by not letting them know that they were going to be online probably for academic year 2020 21 because they don't want to lose the, the revenue the tuition revenue and yet we know already for for many of us the default mode of instruction is online what 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 is our role as educators and that that's something that i've been asking myself is like if i am to be a black woman present in the academy now now on zoom with students who were always coming to take courses with me because uh, there was a possibility for validation, mutual awareness, but also rigorous training in particular ways that you don't get in sociology or history or not like, while many of us are trained in these, in these disciplines. And so we, we don't, we have love for them, but we don't, but, but there's a very particular perspective that comes from social, social justice teaching and, and black studies and Chicana Chicano Central American studies and that you can't get from those places those studies of resistance and radicalism that you don't get because the center of the circle of study is always around whiteness. And so when we center these things, people come to us for this perspective, but they're also coming to us to try to have a different kind of level of engagement, a different kind of form of engagement. And that only escalated once the pandemic um, uh, happened. And so there's never been, I think, more of a desire, especially on the part of students of color for uh, answers about like, who are we now? How do you, so, so what does that require for us as educators is to, is that they need to know that I know who I am. And does that make sense? Uh, they need to know that I know who I am in this institution. I know what, why I'm here and I know what I know the kind of means of production of how do I get ahead? Well, how do I get promoted? I need to know what their position is in the institution because right now so many things, oh, you know, the your every one of you is precious and important, and all of our professors were all drawing together, but around what? What are we drawing around, what drawing together around? The the history of the institution? Because for many of us, we don't we don't identify that way. We don't have, I mean, I love the Bruins, but I don't feel any kind of like, you know, a, a, a affinity around that. I feel affinity around my, especially my black and brown colleagues. So I'm drawing together over different kind of history and struggle. So I need to know who I am in that. And, um, and my students need to see that I know who I am. And that requires a certain kind of presence that we're not trained in. And yet, we have never been more, we've had never had more examples in the ways that the protests have unfolded, in the ways that people have come together in solidarity, in the really unexpected and beautiful and hopeful ways that people have pulled together for each other in all kinds of unsung ways. We have never had more examples of how much we need to be present here and for each other and also to be clear about our purpose. So that's different for everybody. And I, and I don't have an answer for why and how we do that. And I think there's actually too much of that that goes on is tell me the answer then. Tell me why we're here. You have to know you, why you are here. And when students see that and they know that you've sat and thought about it, which is what we do as academics is we, we sit and we think. So if we, if we can think about it, we're intentional about understanding that if, our students are experiencing firsthand and it's very overwhelming the shortfalls of the institution and then also some of the really great things that some institutions have have done it opens these possibilities for mutual awareness and especially when we are self-possessed about what is possible when we understand 
why we're here in the first place. So we have all the things that we need to teach. We've got the syllabi, we've got the lesson plans, we've got the asynchronous and syn synchronous um, lectures, but why are we here? And that really brings us back to this really excellent introduction of the Black pedagogy of presence. What is that? What, what, and, and how can that be something that everybody can learn from? It doesn't, it doesn't mean that only Black people and Black professors are present and, and have to, to, we have to think about it in a way that's different, but everybody should be and can learn from this history of presence that's been here since way before the pandemic. As, as I mean, Ingrid was writing about this so long ago about, about the same thing, because it's always been here. And that is a very rich resource for all of us. So I think I'll just, I'll just stop there and um, maybe people have questions. Well, first of all, I want to say Dave Johnson, Terrence Wooten, you all are amazing. I tell you this all the time, you know, uh, very insightful comments. And, you know, I have to say to everyone, you know, we're used to being bombed, you know? I mean, we get bombed all the time, you know? Terrence being called sassy, my expertise being called into question, you know, gays um, expertise being called into question. You know, if we actually fell to our knees every time we were slighted as black educators, we'd be on our knees all damn day long. <laughs> so, you know, for us, you know, these Zoom, but I must say, you know, I've never been Zoom bombed. But we actually talk about Zoom bombings in our article. So, Terrence, now I can actually feel like I have actually some authority to talk about freaking Zoom bombings, you know? Just like now that I've taught online, I can actually talk about teaching online. <laughs> so, you know, we, and, and look, you all saw Terrence. Terrence didn't skip a beat, right? Uh, Gay didn't skip a beat. So, you know, this is what we deal with, whether we're in a pandemic or not you know, we are constantly dealing with being bombed. And that's, that's, that's racism, that's sexism, that's patriarchy, that's, that, that's heterosexism, that's homophobia, that's all of it, right? So, you know, I just want to say that, that, you know, um, you know, thank you Zoom bombers actually, you know, because you've given us fodder for our research, right on. You've just given, you know, power to us. Terrence, you wanna say something? And I want to add, um, that it's not just the ways that sort of these outside figures come and Zoom bomb us. This, this is happening from our students. This is happening from staff. This is happening from faculty. The, mo the amount of times I've, I've been present, I've given a presentation and someone or been in a, some, in a meeting and someone thought they could just interrupt me because they just thought they could. Um, and that I had to look, I've had to learn how to continue to finish my thought as a form of resistance that you will, I refuse to be silent. You will let me speak. I noticed how you didn't interrupt other people. That's very interesting. So part of my training, what is to both in terms of navigating life while black and gay in the US, but also in, in the context of global anti-blackness, but specifically in learning how to navigate the institution was about learning that as a black as a black PhD holder, I will be challenged. People will not take me seriously. People will interrupt you during a presentation. People will wait to the end to try to figure out ways to eviscerate you. Nothing you say will ever be enough. You will be devalued. And it's not from outside people who have stumbled upon a national conference. It's from folks in your field. It's from people you call colleague. It's from people you sometimes call friend. It's from people who have supported you. It's from diversity, equity, inclusion officers, right? It's actually built into the infrastructure of higher education and we have had to learn how to navigate this along multiple different axes of difference so not just the fact that we're black as if just being black is ever a thing but in the context of multiple different axes of difference that intersect with our blackness that make us somehow not an authority on the very things that we are authority on while also being understood as targets who can be interrupted constantly and consistently. And so this was not really surprising to me, both that we were Zoom bombed because as uh, Dr. Johnson pointed out, the content, the content of, the, of this panel sort of is rife for targeting, but, and the bodies who are the content of this panel are rife for targeting, but also because this happens to me all of the time, all of the time, I mean, just always. Um, and so 
Facebook, just you name it, right? And so I think that th that the question of hyper surveillance and hyper visibility of black bodies and of blackness as death bound, as injury bound, as wedded to deficit is something that we have had to unfortunately learn to navigate, that our students are learning to navigate, that we're teaching our students to navigate. And so I was not surprised that this happened. I, you know, I try to handle it with grace because in a different world, in a different time where this was not being recorded, a few other words might have, <laughs> might have come, and, come had, might have come, escaped my mouth. <laughs> It is, it is actually quite extraordinary that it, that it, um, I mean, some of us have, have experienced this before, but it is extraordinary to have it witnessed by so many folks because, you know, often we're trying to, for some reason, you know, we're always put in this position where we have to convince people that these are the conditions under which we work, but these are the conditions under which we work. And it's, it's very much obvious to you now because you see these things that are popping on the screen, but imagine always being in that situation because of so many things always coming at you but also trying to undermine you try to make fun of the, the seriousness of the subject of the of the agents that we're talking about trying to dehumanize us in, in every way and yet and and the strength and the grace that it takes but also who it is that we learn from about how to be in these spaces and continue and then feel empowered and empower others that's a different kind of presence. And so I just want to also acknowledge all of the people that are here that do this every single day, whether it's in the classroom or it's your book reviews, people who review your books or who, who, who slam the door shut on a journal article or something like that, that does all of these things have material effects on us. But the thing that gets us through is, at least for me today, is that I am, I am so confident in my colleagues. And I know that they share the spirit of um, sustenance and um, resilience. And so I didn't even think for a moment that I was going to have to do anything different, but just keep on being who I was. So I just am, am really happy um, that, that, that this happened in many respects, because it, it, there's no, never a better example than, than, than this. I agree. And that, wow, we have a lot of comments in the chat. This is amazing. Uh, and, you know, thank you all for all the props. And if we have some questions that we can address, we're happy to. Um, yes, and I see or mistaking passion for being an angry Black woman. Yes, you know this. Absolutely. <clears throat> and, you know, I have to say that you know, thinking about, you know, as I'm looking at the chat and, you know, looking, you know, I'm looking for some questions. Um, and again, thanks to everyone for, you know, your, um, your, uh, your uh, just amazing comments here. Wow. Oh, uh, Regina Stevens is, uh, Regina is asking, can we get a copy of your soon to be article? You know, it's, it's going under review, hopefully by Saturday. <laughs> so uh, uh, hopefully we'll know something within the coming weeks, but it's not published yet, but it's going to be under review. Uh, can you talk about getting beyond performance, performance allyship? Okay. Uh, Terrence, <laughs> I don't know. That sounds, you might want to Sorry, I just, this is my quick point takeaway. This is where I'm at in 2020 in life. Mm -hmm. I don't need any more allies. Ally is not a useful category. I don't believe in allies. That it, it, there is no such thing as performance ally. Ally to me itself is performance. I need anti-racist. I need anti-transphobic folks. I need, like, do the work. You can't be, a, what I, I was at a march and I literally saw a sign that says ally to anti-racist. And I said, I, I was like, what does it, what is it? So you, you're not an anti-racist. You're an ally to anti-racist. What does that mean? So I'm actually more interested in now more than ever in people stepping up to do the work opposed to a lot allying themselves with people who do the work because not doing the work is part of the problem. So for me, ally equals always already all the time performance. I need folks to be anti, um, proudly, boldly, all the time, always, because that's the work that we do. I don't need folks who, I can turn to and they'll pat me on the back and say, 
good job. I need people who are going to stand next to me or more, more importantly, use their bodies and stand in front of me. Right. Don't wait, because allies wait for Black people to do the work first and then they join. I don't want you to wait on me to have to start the conversation. I want you to develop the skills and tools to have the conversation, push the conversation, and carry that labor in a responsible way. Ally, the category of ally does not inherently do that. And so I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm like, Drake said no new friends. I'm like, no new allies. I don't, no time for allies. <laughs> and you know, I've heard Terrence speak on this so many times. So I knew he was gonna just like, you know, drop the mic on this one. And yeah, you know, and this whole issue, you know, about allies is, is in many ways problematic because again, as Terrence stated, allies don't want to do the work, you know? Uh, it's simply about, okay, well, how can I help you? Well, no, you're just not helping us. You're helping the cause. You're helping the cause of social justice. That's the point, you know, because then, again, as Terrence stated, then we are doing all the work and then the ally is simply, I don't know, you know, patting us on the back, rubbing our backs, something like that, I don't know. But you know, um, and, and, and I certainly agree with, with, with Terrence about, uh, you know, this whole, this whole issue of allyship being performance, right? You know, I also wanna, I, you know, I, I also wanna bring up a point that, you know, uh, we discuss in the piece and Terrence actually, uh, mentioned this, and the way in which we're able to reach a broader audience online is absolutely amazing. You know, and I would have never known this if I hadn't taught online in 2020. I mean, I actually had parents the last week of class coming into the group-based office hours, just, you know, sticking their head in and saying, Oh, Professor Banks, I want you to know I've been watching your remote lectures and I've, you know, been listening, listening during office hours. I'm like, oh my gosh, I think I was cussing last week. Oh my goodness. But I mean, they said they learned so much, right? So I mean, we have parents, siblings, roommates, cousins, uncles, grandparents, cats, dogs as audiences, right? And they're actually, you know, absorbing, taking in all of this information. Right? And that doesn't happen in the brick and mortar context, right? And so, that, and, and so that's another way in which, you know, my thoughts about online education have evolved actually since 1998. You know, the fact that, again, you know, we got to be home, right? Everyone's on lockdown. You know, the siblings, the parents sitting there, it's like, oh, well, you know, I'm actually going to, you know, watch this remote lecture or I'm going to listen to Dr. Banks's discussion with, you know, her students for 30 minutes a week. You know, I think that that's pretty amazing. I think it's pretty amazing. All right, I'm looking at a chat here. Uh, yes, reading is a good way to begin learning. Uh, and Kim suggests reading the book White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo. It will give you great language, and that's true. And, and I must say, you know, I've read this book. You know, I think I've read half of it. Um, and there, there, there's, there's, there's definitely some, 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 some good information for white folks. Um, let's see. Looking in the chat. Uh, I'm going up because we've gotten so many chats and I know folks have stated things even before. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you all for demonstrating how you keep making lemonade. It is inspiring. I really like that one. That's, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, and, 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 and someone that says, you know, we don't have the language to represent the actions we want to take with you. But, you know, but, but that's just it, you know, there, you know, there are, you know, books and certainly not just by white, white authors, but, you know, black authors to, you know, help you, you know, understand, you know, how you get to this place of even practicing a black, pre a, a black pedagogy of presence, because you don't have to be black to do this, you know, uh, you can actually do what Terrence is doing, you can actually have a virtual background that says, Black Lives Matter, right? So even if, even if you're teaching chemistry, 
you know, even, even if you're teaching a Portuguese class, you know, you can actually, you know, present a black presence, even if it's not a part of what you teach. Of course, the three of us, we teach black studies, right? And so our presence is also embedded in what we teach. But again, you know, that's the great thing about, you know, um, having Tracy Johnson, who I mentioned, uh, she's our co-author. And she's a professor of biology. And one of the things she mentions in the article is that one day she goes into a class, you know, it's like, I don't know, it's an intro to bio course. They're like 600 students. And you know, she walks in, she begins her opening lecture and she notices that a black female student stands up and walks out, right? The student comes back a few minutes later. At the end of class, that black female student comes back, well, I'm sorry, comes, come, comes to the front of the class and says to Tracy, she says, you know what, I'm sorry I got up and left your class. I did not mean to be rude, Professor Johnson, you know, I promise. But when you walked in the class, I had to leave and call my, my mother and tell her, there's a black female professor teaching my class. It's a biology class. And you know what her mother said? Well, get back in there and learn from her. <laughs> and I love that story. I love that story. Because, you know, Tracy, she doesn't teach what I teach and what Terrence teaches and what Gay teaches, right? She's a STEM person. But her presence is important as well. And that's a perfect example. And Terrence certainly mentioned the, you know, stats, the research on the importance of Black students seeing folks who look like them, you know? In fact, that's why I became a professor, because of, of, of my first Black female professor in college. And I was a junior by then. Um, can, I, can I jump yes, in? Please. Yeah, okay. Yes, please. Yes. I see a lot of questions, too, about, um, you know, how do I support um, I, I think it's this question again, uh, uh, imposed differently than uh, around the allyship. And I just want to echo what Terrence said, because a lot of us, um, we're just really clear that the time for allyship is over. The time for you to do the work is now. And part of the way that you do that is to, one, not recenter yourself and your experience as the one that matters the most. Instead, it's act, asking people what they need and want, and then crafting crafting your work toward that end, whether it's your classroom or your syllabus or something for the students. When I do social justice work, community engaged scholarship, I try to get students to see that, that what seem, social justice work seems like a lot of ordinary everyday work, but that there are practical things to be done. There's not statements to make or, or to proclaim or victims to save, believe me, <laughs> there's not. We, we, t we teach our students focus and discipline. We are ourselves focused and disciplined, and we need to help people see, our colleagues and also our students, that what seems like a lot of ordinary work is extraordinary work. We need to take stock of the skills that we have, that many of them are the result of privilege, and we need to think about how those have been denied to working people and to people of color. And understand also that having those skills does not entitle you to determine what is best for a group of people or a community. And so you have to listen, but you also have to decide that as this window of awareness is closing on this moment after all of the, the, the rebellions, because we know that this is a, a, a moment of possible awakening, but we've also seen this before and we see the window close and things go back again. You have to decide, you, that you are not going to let that door close. And the only way is through committing to be that person. And that's the only way. And nobody can do that for you. You gotta do it yourself. And you got to be stay committed to it. And Gay, that's an amazing way for us to end. And I want to thank Gay Johnson. I want to thank Terrence Wooten. I want to thank Deeksha and Angie. And please, please rate our session. And Deeksha has put uh, a link in the group chat. So again, thank you so much. And, and thank you for all of your amazing comments. Uh, we will get a copy, right, Deeksha? And we'll be able to read through all of them. 
Uh, again, um, thanks to my co-panelists, thanks to Course Hero, and thank to all, th thanks to all of you, and keep doing the good fight, the great work that you're doing with regard to social justice work. Right. And be well. <laughs>